Welcome to Global Energy's handover video. This video is designed to answer any questions you guys may have on your new heating system, because after we've commissioned your system, you often have questions that we've not covered during that process. I'm gonna film it in real time, so this video will be continuous all the way through, but don't feel you have to watch it all. Go to the description below and I'll have time stamped the different sections so you can skip ahead to the questions or answers you may require. Okay, so without further ado, we'll continue round to your heat pump itself. So most of you will have a heat pump that looks like the one I'm about to show you. It might be slightly smaller, it may be slightly larger, or you could have one of the green heat pumps. I will we'll drop in a little section right at the end, and there is a description point for it, where you can go and have a look at the green heat pumps. So our units, most of the time, will look like this. Like I say, it might be slightly smaller, maybe slightly larger, but that is it, that is it. It is important that you guys do not put anything to restrict airflow. We are sucking air in the back through this evaporator, this gold thing, and we're ejecting it out of the front where the air is. Do not block that there, on the rear, or in front. We need that air to be able to move. That's how we make the system efficient. Now, a few points on this. That gold evaporator there, or if you've got a green unit, the blue evaporator, over a period of time in winter, will build up a slight amount of snow and ice. This will happen over the course of an hour. Periodically, the unit will stop, reverse itself, and melt that ice. That is what we call the defrost cycle. I will just drop a quick clip in now, showing the defrost cycle in action, so you've experienced it before winter. This is totally normal operation for a heat pump. It'll ice up like this, almost look like it's got snow on it. And then over the course of two to five minutes, it'll defrost itself. Generally, these defrost last, sorry, occur anything up to three times an hour, four times an hour when it's incredible, when it's cold and humid. Currently 2 minutes 38 seconds into the defrost. Really getting it shifted. So currently we're pulling heat from the house to do this defrost cycle. So I hope that little section there helped depict what a defrost cycle looks like. It's totally normal for it to do it. When it finishes, it will put a small plume of steam out the front and then continue back into heating operation. The gravel base below the unit is there to capture any of the condensate or discharge from the defrost cycle into it without it running onto your path. If you do have any condensate running onto your path, please contact your installer. On the rear of the unit, you'll have two isolators. The one on the right in this situation, labelled ASHP, is for the heat pump and should remain on. The one on the left is for the backup heater, and that should remain on too. In the middle, you have two electric meters. One is for the heat pump, one is for the backup heater. This shows your accurate consumption of the entirety of what the unit is used. So you can separate the consumption of the heat pump from every other appliance in your house. If you know what your pence per kilowatt hour is for your electricity, you multiply it by that number. But please note the decimal point. There is two decimal points after your actual reading. The breaker here is for the Ecolink, as is this antenna. The Ecolink connects back to our office. What the Ecolink does is allow us as service engineers to access your unit change any settings that may make it more efficient, or if you've got an issue that you're experiencing, we can log into the unit and adjust the settings. So if you've got any doubts in your mind, please contact us and we can log into the unit and sort it out for you. Now, on the rear of the unit, you've got a pair of pipes 
that run into the house. This is what carries the heat into the house. The two valves on the back should be in line with the pipe. And when they're in line with the pipe, they are on. Another thing to note is the insulation itself. This insulation should be continuous all the way into the property where it disappears. If you can see brass or copper pipe work, please contact your installer because that should be sealed in its entirety. This particular system has a trunking system that encapsulates all of that pipe throughout. What we'll do now is we'll wander into the house. I'll take you up into the loft space and show you the hot water tank. Some of you will have it in your loft some of you will have it in a cylinder cupboard and some of you may well have it in a garage. Where it is doesn't really matter from a functional point of view as long as you can access it. Let's shoot upstairs. So in front of me is the cylinder. I'll now point out all the components and what is relevant to you as a homeowner. Most of you will have a cylinder that looks like this. This is what we call our combi cylinder. The top section of it has the hot water that comes out of your taps. The bottom section has your central heating water in. It is completely separate from your hot water. So hot water in the top, central heating water in the bottom. This acts as a volumizer to give system volume to help the defrost cycle and potential on and off issues with the heat pump. There is specific videos on volumizers in, on our channel if you want to view that. Now, essentially you have a pair of pipes, these two, that run from that trunking I've just shown you outside direct from the heat pump. This is your flow pipe that comes up to your diverter valve. That valve then diverts the water either to hot water or direct to your central heating radiators. It'll then return from your hot water or from your central heating system via the filter. There is a specific video in our channel, and I will link it in the description below, of how to clean that filter out. If your system water quality is of the quality it should be on install, that should only need to be checked during an annual service. If one of our service engineers or service um, technicians on the phone asks you to clean it out, that's when you need to refer to the specific YouTube video on that. On the side of your tank itself, you have a sensor that controls the hot water temperature. That is set up on the screen that I'm gonna show you down in the, um, on the actual control screen for the unit. This thermostat here is purely a safety device. It should remain on 65 degrees and it's got a high limit stat there. That shouldn't be touched and should stay on 65 degrees. These devices here are known as automatic air vents. After commissioning, our commission engineer should turn these off and they should remain off. The two tanks here are expansion tanks. The red one is for the central heating system. As the water in the central heating system heats up, this will take up the expansion in that. This one here is for the hot water tank. As the water in the hot water tank heats up, this takes up the expansion. The only relevance to the consumer here is that. That is what we call the pressure gauge. Now you'll notice we've got a red marker on one bar, okay? That is the minimum pressure for this system. You'll notice the black one is lower than it. In this instance, we will have to repressure the system. This is what we call a filling loop. It has a tap here and a tap here to allow water to pass from the water main into your central heating system. If one of our technicians asks you to top this up, you turn that valve so it's in line with the pipe, in line, and this valve so it's in line with the pipe, and you will hear and see the gauge going up. When that reaches one bar, you then isolate this and this. Depending on your water pressure at your property, will depend how quickly that pressure gauge rises. This one's rising quite steadily. So when it reaches the one bar, we turn that one off. Within your property, you'll have a series of radiators. Most of them will look like the ones that I'm showing you now. So that's a K3 radiator. 
a triple panel radiator. The one in the hallway is slightly smaller. And then again, in the bedroom, we've got another K3 radiator. Now, what you'll notice about these radiators is the pr they are probably quite a bit bigger than the radiators you've experienced on a fossil fuel system. And what we mean by a fossil fuel system is a gas or an oil boiler. Traditionally, we would run a gas or oil boiler at 65 degrees flow temperature. Heat pumps have greater efficiencies at lower flow temperatures. So all we do is size the radiators up according to that flow temperature so we can run them at a lower temperature, but still achieve a good comfort level in your house. The lower the flow temperature, the bigger the radiators, the cheaper your system is to run. So there's a benefit to having those bigger radiators. The way we want to operate this system is low, slow, and continuous. And what we mean by that is allow the heat pump to slowly pump heat into your property. So we encourage you to leave it on continuously with the thermostat set at a level temperature. You'll find your comfort level, be it 18, 19, 20 degrees, and leave it on at that temperature. In a couple of minutes, I'll show you the controller and how to set it up. Now, we also advocate an open loop system. And what we mean by that is leaving as many radiators on as possible to allow the heat pump to have a steady, continuous, large surface area to deliver its heat. What you'll notice is many of your radiators will have normal valves on both ends, and that's what we call open loop. But key radiators, and that'll be bedroom radiators and possibly rooms that have big windows in, we will put thermostatic radiator valves in that look like this. Now, if you want to set your bedroom so it doesn't get any warmer than a certain temperature, you'll find that comfort level by these numbers. Most of the time, anything between two and 3.5 is something between 17 degrees and 21 degrees. Bedrooms often want to be about 2.5 to three, and that'll hold you around 18 degrees. But we do actively encourage you to as much as possible, leave all the radiators open. And I'll explain shortly how we control your room temperature. The commissioning engineer will set your flow temperature according to the design of the radiators. Depending where you live, we will have an outdoor design temperature, ranging between minus five and minus 2.2. And we will size your radiators to keep you at 21 degrees at those outdoor conditions. The flow temperature is set at that lower temperature. Most of the time that's between 40 and 45 degrees. So when the ambient temperature outside is warmer than that, we can run your radiators cooler and still achieve your room temperature. That is known in the industry as weather compensation. Our engineer will set that curve or that line so your radiators will adjust accordingly. That'll stop you getting too warm when the weather's milder and too cold when the weather's cooler outside. But the knock-on effect is a greater efficiency of your heat pump. Remember, the lower the flow temperature, the more efficient your system is. And if we've designed it to work at minus three, it means when it's warmer outside, we can run you cooler and be more efficient. So the devices that control temperature in your property are either the thermostatic radiator valves or the central thermostat. But we want those to act as temperature limiters, not on off stats. They're just there to stop your property becoming too warm in the event of solar gain or other heat inputs such as cooking or multiple occupation, i.e. a party. So I'll now show you the thermostat and how it's best to be set. The idea is that your heating won't turn off per se, it will just tickle or just simmer below that 21 degree set point. And that is the most efficient way to run your system. It's almost like accelerating your car up to 70 miles an hour on the motorway, throttling back to maintain that speed so your car's nice and efficient. It's exactly the same with a heating system. Rather than speeding up and slowing down your heating system or speeding up and slowing down your car, if it's low, slow and continuous, it's much more efficient. Now there is anomalies to this where you have sporadic occupation of your property. 
If you are only occupying your property for a few hours a day, because you may work long hours or shift work, then it is perfectly acceptable to set up a timer on here where you have two different temperatures a day. You may have a setback period, so it's lower whilst you're not occupying the property, and then you raise it by a few degrees whilst you are occupying the property. But we only want a few degrees difference between that. I'll just show you how to set the automatic mode up as well.